Hello, my name is Vivian Maxwell. I am a statistical and data sciences major and geosciences minor at Smith College in my last semester. Um, and I'm here to talk today about developing a partial least squares regression calibration model to predict biogenic silica and organic carbon percentages in high Arctic lake sediment core samples. And this research is supervised by Dr. Devet and Dr. Stout. So before I dive into the sort of statistical analysis um, and, uh, you know, details of this project, I just want to give some brief uh, motivation and sort of background information. Um, so paleoclimatology is the study of past climates, and paleoclimatologists reconstruct past climates to gain insight into the various temperature trends that occurred over time. So in high Arctic settings, biogenic silica and uh, total organic carbon, which are referred to as BSI and TOC, are two proxies that are used to study temperatures. Um, so typically higher BSI and TOC levels indicate warmer temperatures. Um, and so paleoclimatologists will extract BSI and TOC percentages from lake core samples, um, just to sort of understand what the temperature was like in that environment. So the main goal of this work was to create a um, universal calibration model that will provide paleoclimatologists with percentages of BSI and TOC so they can compare their results across various localities and share meaningful results with other researchers. So there are currently a few ways to extract BSI and TOC from lake core sediment samples. Um, but these techniques require a lot of sediment. Um, they're pretty expensive and prone to human error. Sometimes they take a little bit more time but provide high resolution data. And sometimes they're a little bit shorter but provide low quality data. Um, so all of this to say Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy is sort of a novel technique. Um, and it's sort of the happy medium between all of the, the methods out there in that it provides high resolution data on BSI and TOC, um, but it's also cost effective Effective. It requires a small amount of sediment and it's a relatively fast process. So recently there's been a shift to using FTIR spectroscopy to collect high resolution data on BSI and TOC. So how this works is that infrared radiation is beamed by the machine um, onto these samples and this radiation excites the covalent bonds that are present in molecules. And so infrared radiation is absorbed at different wavelengths, depending on the molecular structure. And so it essentially provides a fingerprint of sorts for each molecule. So here's an example. Um, each sample that is run on the FTIR spectrometer will yield an absorbance curve that is similar to the one illustrated in this figure. Um, and so you can see there are this, these three peaks on the right and the orange circle, and that's what we interpret as BSI. So for any sample that has BSI in it, the wave number at which we observe those peaks and absorbance will remain constant. Um, but those peaks will be greater or smaller depending on the amount of BSI in the sample. And then similarly on the left here in that pink, you can see those two peaks, and uh, those are what we interpret to be TOC. And so our main goal is essentially to take these relative absorbance values and to convert them into actual percentages of BSI and TOC so that paleoclimatologists know the exact percentages of BSI and TOC in each sample. Um, so the real question, right? How do you do this? So we um, developed a partial least squares calibration model that essentially converts those absorbance values into percentages. And we focused on BSI since this is the most commonly used proxy, but there aren't really any useful alternative techniques to predict um, BSI percentages. And we, we chose a partial least squares regression model because we're using highly correlated absorbance values to predict BSI percentages. Um, and there are other regression models out there like principin component ana analysis, PCA. Um, and PLS and PCA are similar in that they separate the variability. Um, and so they explain the outer relationships um, between sort of the explanatory variables, which in our case are absorbance values. And then they, explain the um, relationships between the response variables, which in our case are the percentages of BSI. Um, but PLS goes one step further in that it describes the inner relations, basically the relationship between the predictor and response variable. Um, so basically, PLS is beneficial because it's taking into account the effect of absorbance values on um, the predicted percentages of BSI. So it's thinking about what is the relationship between the explanatory variable and how is that affecting the response variable. So um, the data is pre-processed um, on the FTIR machine using um, Opus software. And so it goes through a baseline correction 
Um, and uh, it also goes through an atmospheric correction. And that basically is just removing the effects of air and water vapor. Um, and then between each sample, a blank is run, which accounts for atmospheric water vapor and carbon dioxide. And so once that data is offloaded from the machine, um, we um, input it into R. And I've actually written several R functions that will read in the data and then reformat it into a format that the PLS model expects. And it's important to isolate the absorbance values because that is what we use to input into the PLS model to predict percentages of BSI. Um, and so once we sort of have the model, we need to choose a cross-validation method. And cross-validation, uh, briefly, is just allowing our it allows us to approximate our performance on new data by leaving some training data out. So we chose, there's a bunch of different um, methods for cross-validation. We went with a k-fold method, um, and that's dependent on sample size. So for our samples, we had 28, so we went with a five-fold. So basically, um, there's one testing group, and then there are four training groups, and then uh, we repeat that five times so that each group is, is, becomes the testing group at least once. Um, and then once we've done that, we also can assess how well we did on our test data to see where our model is over and under predicting BSI percentages. Um, and this is essentially done just by calculating the residual error between the actual known percentages of BSI and then our model's predicted percentages of BSI. So the model itself, we're very lucky. There's actually a PLS model already written um, that is uh, it's written by Mevic and Varens, and I've included a link if you want to go explore that. Um, so we really had to just focus on the number of components in the validation method. So we told the model to um, fit for 10 components to allow a wide range from which to choose. And then um, we, um, we decided on a five-fold cross-validation method since our sample size is 28. Um, and so then in order to determine the number of components for our model, um, we created a root mean square error plot. And so a small root mean squared error is indicative of a more accurate predictive power of the model. So as you can see both in the output on the left and the graph on the right, um, three components is actually pretty good in explaining um, the variance in X without overfitting the model. Um, so that's why we decided to go with three components. And then um, we also, I uh, just developed some loading plots. So uh, loading plots are basically, they just highlight parts of the spectrum that the model is heavily weighting. Um, and so we can actually see if you compare the loading plot to the absorbance curve. So the absorbance curve is on the left and the loading plot is on the right, we can see similarities, right? So the model you can see is detecting and it's placing emphasis on those wave numbers where we're seeing BSI and where we're seeing TOC. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And also our wave numbers for the PLS uh, loading plot are very similar to those described in the literature by Rosin et al. Um, so this is pretty exciting. And then finally, just to determine the model accuracy. So on the left here, you can see in gray is the actual percentages of BSI, and then in yellow is the predicted um, percentages that our model has predicted. Um, and then on right is sort of a residual error. So in green is where the model is over predicting, and in red, the model is under predicting. Um, and so you can see for each sample, it, it's not perfect. There are some samples where we see very small residual errors, which is very exciting. Um, but then we also see large overfitting, large underfitting for certain um, samples as well. So uh, our next steps are to input a new data set of 100 Alaskan samples into the model and sort of see whether more samples maybe um, allows the model to better predict um, or to have a more accurate prediction. Um, we also we want to know whether or not this model is site specific or if it can be applied to various localities. So this model right here is um, using samples from Greenland. Uh, so we're curious to see whether or not if we if we input uh, samples from Alaska, is the model going to freak out or is it going to predict uh, you know like pretty well um, or do we need to create a new model that's just using Alaskan samples? Um, and then finally, we want to just figure out a sample size. So this model here is based on 28 samples, which is, in my opinion, a pretty small number. Um, and so I'd be curious to see if we um, 
if we notice at some point like, oh, 50 samples, anything above 50, our model isn't really predicting any more accurately. Um, so that's sort of what we would like to determine. Um, and then these are just my references. Um, and again, if you have any uh, recommendations or thoughts um, on the process, I'd be very excited to hear what you have to say and what you think about all of this. Um, so please feel free to, to share your opinions and comments. Um, and thank you so much for listening.